Modern atheists, in their cynical reason, may be the most devout believers. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. Also check out my Patreon page. Hello everyone, welcome to Flickr Theory Reviews. I'm your host, Taras Vinokur. Today we will put politics and theology in the same pot. By looking at the book Political Theology by Saul Newman, we will analyze the relationship between the contemporary state and the divine power. I will answer the question whether it's actually possible to have a purely secular government that is totally removed from all religious symbols and ceremonies. Is it possible to deprive all political activities of religious mythology? But first, let's discuss the author of this book. Who is Saul Newman? Saul Newman is a political theorist, currently he's a professor at Goldsmiths University of London. Actually, he was one of my professors when I was doing my master's degree there. Anyways, most of Saul Newman's research is in the field of post-anarchism, which is a kind of a anarchist philosophy that is infused with fancy post-structuralist concepts. To put it simply, post-anarchism moves away from the anarchist focus on the eradication of the state, yet it still maintains the classic revolutionary potential of anarchism in creating autonomous modes of thinking and acting. Post-anarchism is basically just diet anarchism. Let's for a moment consider Saul Newman's essay Post-Anarchism and Radical Politics Today. Newman here insists that as we're dealing with new forms of religious fundamentalism, neoliberalism, and neoconservatism, we're in desperate need for a new conceptualization of radical politics. For Newman, such radical political theory is post-anarchism, which deprives itself of the classical anarchist preoccupation with essentialist human nature, it deprives itself of social positivism, and of ideas about imminent social rationality that drives revolutionary change. Turns out we don't need any more revolutionary change. We're done with that. Newman emphasizes that post-anarchism moves away from class politics and finally acknowledges that social reality is discursively constructed. Post-anarchism, in other words, accounts for the external forces of power and language that affect the creation of a political subject. Newman even goes as far as to utilize psychoanalysis in his post-anarchist theory. He wants to show that the unconscious forces, desires and drives always exceed rational political control. No matter what we do, Freud shows up and he ruins our day. By analyzing the relationship between the subject and social structures, we can, as Newman maintains, attain even greater degree of autonomy and spontaneity than that proposed by classical anarchists such as Proudhon or Bakunin. Post-structuralist theory, in other words, can bring in a discursive cultural space where political subjectivity can be reconfigured. But how much of classical anarchism is still left in post-anarchism? Well, as Newman maintains, post-anarchism is still anarchism because it focuses on actual practices of political emancipation rather than on strategies of reforming institutional arrangements. In other words, post-anarchist theory preserves the classical anarchist skepticism of state sovereignty. Saul Newman here follows Russian classical anarchist Bakunin, who claimed that the equality of political rights entailed by democracy is ultimately incompatible with political right of sovereign state, which will inevitably end up blocking people's political rights. To put it simply, anarchists maintain that political equality can only exist in tension with the sovereign right that stands above society and determines the conditions under which political equality can be exercised. By extension, Post-anarchists maintain that political equality is still basically incompatible with state sovereignty. This is the reason why Newman considers post-anarchism to be the most suitable ideology for analyzing contemporary radical politics, since it is, by default, skeptical of political authority and it always privileges practices of collective autonomy and egalitarian emancipation over institutional reform. Now let's discuss the book Political Theology. Here, Newman critiques sovereign state power by focusing on the theological dimension of politics. In a word, Newman here is saying that secularization of state mechanisms can actually generate a desire for a return to the pre-modern 
power of sovereignty. Consider this. We're now dealing with a resurgence of authoritarian, nationalist, anti-immigrant populism. These movements are responses to the liberal values of openness, toleration, and human rights. Essentially, national sovereignty is coming back to the center of our political life due to the fact that people are feeling disillusioned with secularized, globalized societies. They want to experience political sovereignty as a spiritual foundation, as a transcendent, omnipotent force. Newman writes, The renewed desire for a strong state and a unified, homogenous identity can be seen as symptomatic of an increasingly abstracted and virtualized form of existence, where centers of power and sources of authority and legitimacy are more obscure and amorphous. Here, Newman discusses Nazi jurist and political theorist Carl Schmitt, who claimed that meaningful sovereignty can appear only during the state of exception. That is to say, Schmitt thought that liberal preoccupation with the normal rule of law undermines the power and the significance of sovereignty. More importantly, for Carl Schmitt, sovereignty is always imbued with religious significance. In reaction to the modern secularization of the state, Schmidt saw the sovereign as analogous with God, as the supreme lawgiver. We can consider the sovereign as a kind of a savior of the people in times of political secularization and nihilism. The sovereign demands absolute obedience from the people and, in return, he offers them a concrete spiritual foundation. We're all just basically looking for a pep talk from a powerful figure. As a post-anarchist, Newman obviously disagrees with Schmitt's overarching argument. But he thinks that Schmitt's analysis is very valuable when we undertake to understand the contemporary relationship between politics and religion. Newman writes, Schmitt is right in pointing to the structural recurrence of the problematic of sovereignty, which is revealed every time a social order undergoes a crisis of legitimation, as the liberal order is currently experiencing. That is to say, the growing popularity of authoritarian nationalist political forces today shows that the question of sovereignty is still central to politics. In Newman's opinion, we need to be aware of the importance of sovereignty as an imaginary point of reference that fixes meanings and gives coherence and unity to chaotic, atheistic, globalized society. Bakunin, Bakunin, Bakunin. Bakunin, Bakunin, Bakunin. When analyzing sovereignty, Newman turns to classical anarchists, who, as he claims, often make the best diagnosticians of the problem of political theology. For example, Bakunin's approach to political theology could be seen as antithetical to Schmitt's, in that Bakunin critiques all idealists who abstract moral principles from the materiality of life, suspending them above the living forces of society. Bakunin thinks that the state stands above the society the same way that God stands above the world and nature. Newman, in fact, argues that Schmitt's exaltation of sovereignty is a response to the threat from someone like Bakunin, who is pushing satanic, atheistic, materialist, revolutionary politics. Newman writes, If there is a relationship of enmity at work in Schmitt's political theology, Bakunin and the anti-political theological gesture of revolutionary anarchism emerge as the real enemy. Then, Newman discusses German philosopher Max Stirner, who was, like Bakunin, extremely hostile to state authority. Stirner's approach, however, is different from Bakunin's because, like Schmidt, Stirner critiques the atheist-humanist discourses of revolutionary politics. In other words, Stirner shows that secular modernity is itself haunted by quasi-theological fanaticism. However, Stirner's approach to secularism is still diametrically opposed to Schmitt's. Whereas Schmitt wants state sovereignty to save the society from the collapse of religious authority, Stirner wants to get rid of all transcendence once and for all. He wants to be done with it. In other words, whereas Schmidt thought that liberal secularism was too nihilistic, Stirner thought that liberal secularism was not nihilistic enough. Newman writes, 
Stirner's contribution to the political theological debate lies, I argue, in freeing our subjectivity from the fixed forms of identification determined by religious idealism and in showing how we might live in the world rather than in the next. In other words, Stirner shows that even modern secular humanism was simply a reinvention of Christianity, which made the figure of man the new god. Then, Newman takes up psychoanalysis to analyze the psychic dimension of political theology. Newman here quotes Lacan, who said that the true formula of atheism is not God is dead, the true formula for atheism is God is unconscious. This means that secularism did not get rid of God, it merely repressed and internalized the divine power. Here we can again follow Sturmer, who said that secularism is itself haunted by the categories of theological thought. As Newman writes, uh, modern atheists, in their cynical reason, may be the most devout believers. In this book, Newman presents anarchism as a counterpoint to Schmidt's exaltation of sovereignty. At the same time, Newman shows that anarchist secularism itself can quickly become quite dogmatic. Newman therefore asks anarchists to be careful not to reaffirm what they oppose. Anarchists have to move away from stubborn, dogmatic fights against the sovereign state. For Newman, revolution against state power needs to be rethought. He thinks that it may not be very productive for today's anarchists to seek for an apocalyptic revolutionary event that would destroy all political transcendence. Instead of focusing on the destruction of state order, it may be more productive, says Newman, to build new kinds of social organizations that would give people a greater degree of autonomy from state power. The important point that Newman is making here is that religious transcendence in politics can come back as a response to materialist secularization. We therefore need to continue having this discussion about the relationship between religion and the state. We need to face the fact that theology still plays a huge role in contemporary politics. After all, secularization of state is only a temporary repression of transcendence and sovereignty. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.